Hello, we're Soul Margin Fishing and Conservation Foundation, and welcome to our channel. Come join us here every Sunday for Soul Sunday, where we release new videos. Please donate to our cause and subscribe now. All right, everyone, welcome to the Sharks Bite webinar tonight. I'm very excited and um, excited about the subject and also excited about the speaker. I am Captain Sam Baker, the founder of Soul Margin Fishing and Conservation Foundation. We are streaming live on multiple platforms. We're on YouTube, Facebook, as well as our Soul Margin Fishing and Conservation Foundation website. Um, if you have any questions that come up while you're watching this webinar, I want to tell you to put those questions in the chat box because what we will do is we will um, address those at the end of the presentation. So again, whatever platform you're in, make sure to put those questions in those chat box in that platform. There are some students that are attending the webinar. So um, wanna make sure to send us a PM with your name and your email. So you'll be able to receive the service letter uh, for your attendance today. So again, I'm excited and I'm ready to hear from our speaker. So let me introduce you to her. So Kenzie Horton is a native of Florida who received her bachelor's in marine science um, at the University of South Florida in 2016. Um, she's worked in biomechanic labs um, as well. And right now she's um, getting her master's at Jacksonville University in studies of white sharks. Um, that, that study that she's doing is looking at the uh, spatial area that the sharks are using. And right now she's also working with the FWC, that's Florida uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission as a uh, fisheries biologist. She also, what, what she does with that, she's, they do independent monitoring of data managed or non-managed of, uh, of fish and also some micro um, invertebrates. So in addition to, in addition to that, Kenzie does all type of speaking engage engagements where she is, um, I think she can tell you she just got back from Australia, I think for the um, World Convention for White Sharks. So I'm, I'm just excited to hear more from her. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go ahead and bring her in and we're not gonna waste any more time. So everybody get excited to meet Kenzie. So, hey Kenzie, how you doing? Thank you for taking your time out today to, to meet with us. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you for having me. Man, I'm doing amazing. You know how technology is? It's fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we try yeah. to do what we can and keep pushing forward. So, yeah. So, um, we just, again, excited to hear about you. Thank you for taking your time out your busy schedule. I know you just got off from a, um, an expedition in North Carolina um, going through great um, short Sorry, going after white sharks and studying it on them. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can touch on that a little bit. But uh, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to turn it over to you to uh, be able to start your presentation. So take it over, Kenzie. Awesome. Thank you, Sam, for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, yeah, I, thank you for that introduction. I, I can go over a little bit more about my, uh, my experiences in the past month. I was in Australia for the uh, White Shark Global Conference that brought together the world's leading experts on white sharks to talk about their research and gaps in the research and trying to figure out how we can 
improve the conservation and protection of the species worldwide. And then I was also working with OSEARCH for my master's thesis in the Carolina region. Um, we didn't get any sharks in this latest expedition so far. They're still out there, so fingers crossed that they get them in the next few days. Um, but I'm very excited to be working with them for my master's, but I can talk more about that later on if you guys have any more questions on those two things. Um, but for the presentation, um, I'm going to be doing a presentation on the importance of sharks and the role they play in the environment. Uh, for this webinar, I'll be touching on how the media portrays sharks, a little bit of background information on, on sharks and why this background information is important to learn, some safe swimming practices, and then again, some tools and resources that you can use to ID different sharks, learn more about sharks, and get more involved in the conservation and protection of sharks. So I love this quote uh, by Sylvia Earle. Um, it states, sharks are beautiful animals, and if you are lucky enough to see lots of them, that means you're in a healthy ocean. You should be afraid if you're in an ocean and you don't see sharks. This is really important, I think a great reminder that sharks are very important and vital to our, our ocean and as an indicator of the health of the ocean. And as we are protecting and serving these sharks and all the different species worldwide, we're hopefully gonna see more and more sharks and with more and more sharks in the ocean are gonna be more and more human and shark interactions. And it's really important that we learn how to respect and learn how to coexist with these sharks in their environment. So unfortunately, the media portrayal of sharks has been not so great in the recent years. Um, we've definitely improved um, in the past few years, but since the movie Jaws came out, we've seen an unfortunate negative look on sharks we see more dramatic headlines, see sensationalized stories or content um, that are these more dramatic, um, darker, um, more violent uh, uh, titles. And then they also have this language that promotes a lot of fear. And this, even though they are just words on paper, they can actually create a heightened fear around sharks. And also it influences the perception of sharks. Unfortunately, after the Jaws movie, came out, there was actually a large cull of sharks. People thought they were protecting people and removing sharks from the beaches. They thought they were doing a good thing. Was They were doing it out of fear, but unfortunately they were hurting the ecosystem. And we're gonna to touch more on why removing sharks from the ecosystem is a very bad thing. And which is very, and a very interesting thing is Jaws created two different things. Jaws either created people that were afraid of sharks or it actually influenced a lot of people to become marine biologists. Myself included and many of my coworkers actually say that JAWS was the start of their marine biology career. We were very interested in the biologist. Um, these are different news articles that have come up over the years. Um, and you can see news articles from the media as well as uh, shark shows and their, their titles. And you can see that there's these very dramatic titles, um, Florida shark, blood in the water, the layer of the great white shark, monster under the bridge, killer shark, you can see that these are these very fear laden languages that is promoting that these sharks are monsters or man eaters when they're really not. Sharks do not pose a, a threat to humans. And it is learning how to coexist with these sharks, which is really important and learning how to change the language that we are when we're talking about sharks is really important because sometimes a shark interaction is Maybe they're swimming along uh, along a surfer or there's a graze and it's not something that's fatal or, or bad. It's just a small interaction, but it can be promoted on the media as a shark attack instead of a shark interaction. So really changing the language around how we view sharks and how we are viewing sharks in the media is really, really important. And I think it's really important to learn a bit more about sharks as a whole to be able to understand and be able to create this respect for sharks. Um, the fear of the unknown is very powerful. And as we as we fear something and we don't know about it and this mystery is surrounding this species, it is very easy to become afraid and come up with a lot of uh, things in your mind. So as we learn more and more about these species, we can actually figure out how to kind of coexist and how to live with sharks and, and see how important they are and why they're important. So we're gonna start with some basic shark biology and talk about where they're found, and then go into what a keystone species is and how they play that role. So some basic shark biology. Uh, we're gonna go over some anatomy to the first start. This is a, a image a figure that I actually use at work all the time. It's got a great reminder of the different T shapes, different snout shapes, fin placement, and just some basic um, 
uh, terminology. So first we're going to start with the first dorsal fin. This is the one you're probably most familiar with. It's the one that you will see above the water when the, the shark is at the surface. Then we have the second dorsal fin that's also in the top part of the, of the shark. It's also usually a little bit smaller, but some sharks actually have the first dorsal and the second dorsal about the same size. And that's actually how you can differentiate different species. You can tell them apart. We have, uh, sharks have two sets of paired fins. The first starting the pectoral fin, which is closer to the head, and it's gonna be um, on the side of the, on the, of the shark, closer to the gills. Then we have the caudal fin, which is gonna be the tail fin in the back. Then we have the second set of paired fins, which is the pelvic fins. And then finally, we have the anal fin. Um, these are all the, all the different fins that can be found on the shark. And finally, we have what's called the interdorsal ridge. So we know there's a first dorsal and a second dorsal. This interdorsal ridge runs along between the first dorsal and second dorsal fin. And this comes into play really important later on when I talk about shark ID. Um, another really cool thing that sharks actually have different caudal fin shapes. So we can actually tell a lot about where the sharks are in their environment, what type of um, prey species they're going after, if they're going after fast moving ones, if they're on the bottom, finding more slower moving species. We can tell a lot about the shark based on its caudal fin. So first I'm gonna start with the short fin mako we can see in the bottom. We can see that fin, the top lobe or the top portion is equal to the bottom lobe and the bottom portion. So they're about equal in height. And we can see that this is actually used for very fast moving open water uh, ocean. So we can tell that we, we know immediately that the shark is gonna be found in those open ocean pelagic waters. Um, another cool thing is this shark's tail is called a lunate tail. And a good way to remember lunate is another name for moon is Luna. So that tail look, kind of looks like a crescent moon. So you remember Luna and lunate. And you can tell that those, those sharks, like the short fin mako and the great white shark, are found in more open pelagic waters. Another kind of honorable mention I like to point out is the common thresher shark. They have this really elongated upper lobe. Um, that lobe length is usually about the same size as the shark. So it's kind of, it's very different compared to the other shark species but this is also used for burst swimming and fast movements, but they can also use it to use it like a whip to stun their prey. And I actually have a video of them doing this later on, which I think is really neat to see. So going over some shark basics, um, sharks are cartilaginous fish, um, which means that they are made of cartilage. So they actually have no bones. Um, cartilage is what's found in your nose and your ear. So they are, they're, their body, they're basically what their skeleton is, is actually made of cartilage. They have seven different senses, so they have two more than us. So they have hearing, smell, pressure, which is with their lateral line that runs along their body, sight, electrical perception, so the ampullae of Lorenzini or all those dots you'll see on their face and snout. And then they have touch and taste. Um, looking at the picture on the top right, you can see that they're actually using different senses at different distances when they're coming towards an object. So hearing is going to be the first sense they, they use and then it goes down the line until they get really close where they'll use more of taste and touch to figure out what type of prey it is. Um, sharks have five to seven gill slits. So their gills along um, just above their pectoral fin. Um, generally, most sharks actually have five gill slits, but some do actually have six and seven gill slits. Um, there are two shark species that are aptly named um, the six gill shark and the seven gill shark and they're named that because they have six and seven gill slits. Um, something really cool that I didn't know about until I got my undergrad was the skin is actually made up of what's called dermal denticles or placoid scales, which are actually modified teeth that cover the body that aid in protection and hydrodynamics. So it helps them swim through the water and protects them against other shark species as well as the environment. Um, you can see the picture, there's like a zoomed in image from a microscope of what these dermal denticles look like. It's very interesting, they're actually they're actually a modified tooth that actually sit within the skin and actually are covered in the same materials that are made of, made of, made of teeth. Uh, so another shark basics we're looking at is the sharks are ectotherms. So ectotherm means their body temperature is controlled by the environment, so uh, cold-blooded. Um, there actually are a few exceptions. So most sharks are ectotherms, cold-blooded. There are a few exceptions in the family Lamnidae. Um, the family Lamnidae uh, includes the white sharks, the threshers, um, the poor beagles, and the makos. And what um, these sharks are are considered endotherms. So endotherm means that they can internally generate heat. So they're more considered warm-blooded. And they do that through a process called countercurrent heat exchange. 
So we can see in the picture that they have blood vessels that run along their gills and into the body. And when the sw shark is swimming, especially during burst swimming, these muscles that are used for swimming generate heat. And these arteries run along those muscles and pick up that heat and then are able to transfer it to different parts of the body. And because they're able to do this, they're able to withstand different temperature ranges from very wide and very, very warm and very cold. And they're also able to uh, have faster digestion and they're able to process different stimuli in the water. So when they're coming close to a prey item or different fish, they can actually figure out what it is much faster than um, a cold-blooded shark. So some other cool facts, um, the liver in sharks actually take up 20 to 30% of the shark's body, body weight. They are they have multiple lobes, so they're it's not just one or it's not just one piece. It actually runs along both sides of the body. Um, it takes up almost majority of the body cavity of the shark. So it's a very large organ. Um, they use this liver for buoyancy. Uh, the liver contains a very nutrient rich oil. So it, it can be used as a food reserve. So they have lots of nutrients in that oil. And because they're using it for buoyancy, it replaces a swim bladder that you would see in a fish. And so I mentioned these oils. Sharks are actually fished for these oils. Um, a lot of different industries will use these oils for lubricants, uh, food additives, cleaning agents, uh, tanning leathers, and cosmetics. The uh, skincare uh, industry actually uses a lot of these oils for their skincare um, ingredients. Um, moving on to how they actually breathe in the water. So sharks have two modes of ventilation. So how they're taking oxygen in the water to breathe. Um, there are two ways, or one is called buccal pumping, so they actually will open and close their mouth, and by doing so, it pumps the water over their gills, and they're able to get the oxygen from that. Um, you probably have heard that most sharks have to continue swimming to be able to breathe and to get oxygen. Um, that is not true for all sharks. There are a few species of bottom-dwelling sharks that actually can use this buccal pumping to get, to get the oxygen. Um, but ram, veltra ram veltra ventra <laughs> ventilation sorry, um, is how they actually get oxygen um, by active swimming. So when they are swimming, what we're most commonly seeing a shark moving through the water, the water will move through their mouth over their gills and that's how they're getting their oxygen. So they have two ways of doing it. Um, sharks also have, an ad have adapted um, the T-shape to kind of help catch their prey. So we can actually look at their teeth and figure out what type of prey species they're eating. And so the teeth can be used for puncturing, tearing, shredding, and crushing. And we can see that if they're if they have more crushing style teeth, that they're going to be more on the bottom, and they're going to be feeding on either different uh, crustaceans such as crabs and shrimp, or they'll be um, doing any, uh, eating any type of like shelled uh, like clams or oysters, stuff like that. And because these teeth are need to stay sharp and need to be able to um, puncture or crush their prey, they're actually constantly replaced. So if you ever look at a shark jaw, you'll see they have one row of teeth in the front, but they have all these rows behind them that as the teeth in the front dull, they will actually fall out and then they'll be replaced by a brand new sharper uh, tooth from the back. So they are constantly replaced through the entire life of the shark. Uh, reproduction, reproduction in sharks is really, really important. And this comes to play when you're looking at fisheries and sustainability. So looking at healthy shark populations. And when, we're, when we were removing sharks from the environment, especially um, sharks that take a long time to reproduce, um, it can be very damaging to the population and it would be hard for them to bounce back to a healthy, healthy number. So most sharks are really slow to reproduce. Um, they are slow to grow. They're late to maturity. So um, it takes a long time for them to be able to have more, more pups. Um, an example is the great white shark that actually takes up to 20 years to become mature. So it takes a very long time. Um, some sharks have small litters, so they can only have one at a time, sometimes two, so that when they are actually reproducing, it'll take them a lot longer to reproduce, but then they'll only have one or two. So it, and sometimes they may not live. So that can become a problem when we're removing too many sharks from the population. And they generally have longer gestation. So the amount of time the shark spends in the mother's womb. So sometimes they can take up to 12 months and that can, again, affect how often they can reproduce. Um, a fun fact, uh, sharks actually have 10 different ways of reproduction and how 
um, they give birth and it's usually based on how they um, take up nutrients from the mother. But in simple terms, there are two major ways of um, reproduction and uh, giving birth, which is egg laying and live birth. You can see the picture on the right has three different um, different uh, shark and ray uh, egg casings. So the, the corkscrew one, which is, I think is a really neat one, is actually from a Port Jackson shark or a horn shark. And that corkscrew is very unique because it will be laid in a rocky area. And as the waves move that egg, the, the, the corkscrew will help it kind of twist into the rocks to kind of protect that egg casing. And as I had mentioned that these factors of, of slow growth, late maturity and small litters and longer gestation really play a huge factor in the, in the role in fisheries sustainability. So we wanna make sure that when we're shutting down different um, shark fisheries, we're doing it because the population has reached a number that it's gonna take a lot longer for those, that population to bounce back. So where are they found? They're actually found worldwide. So sharks are found in most oceans that range from all the way to polar Arctic regions to tropical regions. Um, we know there are over about 500 known shark species and they range from the open pelagic ocean to the bottom dwellers to tropical, and some can even be found in rivers. Um, we'll talk about a bull shark later on, but bull sharks can actually be, be found all the way up in fully fresh water, which is a very unique characteristic of that shark. So I mentioned keystone species, and this is a really, really important uh, part when it comes to sharks within our, in our oceans. Keystone species means that they play a very vital or crucial role in keeping the ecosystem in balance. Um, they are a major player within the food web. And when you remove these keystone species or these sharks, you can create a shift in the ecosystem or a collapse in the entire ecosystem. And sharks usually hold the predator keystone species role within ecosystems. And sometimes I would like to mention as like a Sharks don't always hold a keystone species in when you think of an ecosystem in a smaller term, but generally when you're thinking about the ocean overall, sharks play this keystone role. And sharks are actually used to indicate the health of an ocean. Like I mentioned from the quote at the beginning, sharks are very, very important for the ocean. And as we're seeing more and more, that means the health of our ocean is increasing. And they do this because they can scavenge on dead animals that help reduce the amount of carbon released, which helps with climate change and other key, uh, important things. And this, we, they're also a key component in preservation of marine resources. So they help, um, they help not only in the ocean, but they help with the ecosystem on land. So I'm gonna go over this classic model um, of what a keystone species is. And I really like this one, because this is the one that I learned when I was learning what a keystone species was. So we, we know that in the kelp forest off of the coast of, uh, of California, otters are what, are what the keystone species is, is in that ecosystem. On the picture on the left side of the screen, you can see that on the top part, when otter, sea otters are present, the ecosystem is healthy. There's, there's a, a healthy population of fish. There's lots of kelp forest, which is habitat for a bunch of other creatures and different fish and crabs. But when the sea otters are absent, when they're gone, we can see that the entire area is now wiped out and we're missing a lot of, a lot of fish species and, and that keystone species. So what it's showing on the right side of the screen is when you have a lot of sea otters, they will feed on the sea urchins and the sea urchins will feed on the kelp forest. But when you have a, a lower number of sea urchins, you have the kelp forest kept in check where you're having a lot of kelp forest, which is again, a habitat for lots of other animals. So when, you, when the orca was introduced and the orca came into that area, it started feeding on the sea otters. So the sea otter population went down. So that meant that there were less sea urchins being eaten. And when there was more sea urchins in the environment, there means there was more kelp, kelp forest being consumed as well. So we were seeing a decrease in lower amounts of the kelp forest. So we can see that the sea otters kind of kept it in check, but when you remove the sea otters, the urchins start eating more and more of the kelp forest, which then took away a lot of the habitat for the other creatures. So this is important because sharks kind of play the role of the of where the otter stands. They're a keystone species of keeping the next levels in the food web in check. So they create that stability. So we can see in this image, we have different levels of the food web. So starting at the bottom, we have phytoplankton, then going to zooplankton, filters, predators, and then top predators. 
And this is all kept in line and balance and check because of the top predators that sit at that very top level, and especially the sharks being that keystone species. And so sharks, you can see based on the lines in that image that they eat a variety of different uh, prey items that can include squid, fish, stingrays, other sharks, turtles, crabs, and much more. But when we remove that shark, then we'll see that the, the food web will start to collapse because you'll see an increase in the items that it normally would feed on. So all the fish species, the populations would, would increase drastically, which would be great for a, for a time, but then they'd be eating the other, their prey, so they all the big fish would be eating all the squid, the squid populations would decrease. That would be there'd be no food left for those larger fish, which then would cause a collapse, and that would cause a collapse that would trickle down for the entire food web. So we can see that sharks hold this very important role in keeping the ecosystem and the food web in check. And this image is a very simplified, a very simple version of what the food web actually is, because in this image, this is actually a more complex and more realistic version of what the food web like looks like. But even this image is a simplified version of the food web in the North Atlantic. So you can see when we're removing a species, how connected each of those levels are and how everything works together and removing a major player as a keystone species would really affect the rest of the food web. So now that we have a little bit of a background of the basics of sharks and what they are, what makes a shark a shark, the role that they play in the environment, how, how the reproduction really affects how, how, you know, how they can increase the population and how that will, if they're slow to reproduce, then it affects the fisheries and it affects also where they, where they are standing within the food web. And if we were to remove those sharks, then we would see a cascade, a trickle down effect where we would see a collapse in the food web, which would affect the oceans as well as um, the ecosystem on land. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit some uh, shark ID. So some important shark species that we see in Florida, and I think some interesting shark species that we see in Florida. Um, and we're going to start with the oceanic white tip. Um, I think this is a very neat species. Um, it's very unique. It has these very wide pectoral fins. Uh, they have this white tip that kind of modeled on the, the very tips of those pectoral fins. These are found in the open pelagic ocean. They're usually scavengers, so they're always looking for food. So when they see something, they're going to go for it and test it to see if, if it's food. Um, but they are very, very just unique fish um, in the open ocean. Um, the next one is a basking shark. Now this one's actually related to the great white shark. You can actually see that it has a very similar body shape minus this giant gill slits, but the body shape is actually very similar to a white shark. And this one is very commonly mistaken um, as a white shark. The major difference is, is the basking shark is a filter feeder. So it feeds on plankton. So it opens its mouth really wide as it swims through the water. It filters that water over its gills and collects all the plankton. Um, but it's very interesting because these actually are found off of the uh, North Florida waters. Um, this is the nurse shark that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's a really neat species. And you can see that in this video, it's using what I mentioned earlier, um, they call buccal pumping. So it's opening and closing its mouth and it's pumping that water over its gills to get the oxygen. These guys are unique. Um, they actually have barbels. You can see on its snout, it has those two um, skin uh, hanging down. They're called barbels. Um, those are very unique to the nurse shark. Um, they also have their first and second dorsal fin are almost nearly equal in height. It's a very unique characteristic for them as well. And they have this more broad squared face. The next is the tiger shark. So similar snout, they have a very squared blunt snout. Um, but what their very unique characteristic is they have these stripes um, that look like tiger stripes. Um, you can, they are along the body when they're actually younger. These strikes are much more apparent. They're very bright. Um, they're very cute when they're when they're really young. Uh, but these guys have uniquely shaped teeth that have a notch. Um, these guys are also scavengers, and they're usually um, one of their favorite snacks is actually sea turtles. And their teeth are designed to be able to crush the the sea turtle shell and kind of tear through it. So they're very uniquely designed for that particular prey item. Next is the great hammerhead. Um, 
The great hammerhead has a very large dorsal fin and um, it has that unique head shape. Um, I'm sorry if this is the music, the sound is a little too loud. Um, I'll try to talk a little bit over it. But the hammerheads have that very unique hammerhead. Um, it's also called a cephalofoil. Um, but what's unique about the gray hammerhead, as I mentioned, is they have this very large dorsal fin that's what's called sickle shaped. So they have their fins are very angled, but the, the great hammerhead actually has the largest dorsal fin out of the hammerhead species. But we also get a few different species of hammerheads that include the smooth hammerhead and the scalped hammerhead. So the differences you can see are based on these areas that are, that are on the arrows and circled. So a smooth hammerhead doesn't have the indent like the scalloped and great hammerhead does, but it also but it has the pointed notches on the eyes. Um, the great hammerhead has the indent in the center of its, of its head, but it doesn't have any of the notches. And then the scalloped hammerhead has the indent and the pointed um, indents along, along the side of its head near its eyes. And these are really easy way that if you catch a hammerhead, you can quickly tell which species it is just based on looking at these three points. Next is the mako shark. This is one I mentioned earlier. It's an open ocean, fast moving shark. It's actually the fastest shark in the ocean. It has a very streamlined, thin body with that lunate tail. So Luna, Luna lunate. Um, has a pointed snout and it has these very long, sharp, uh, thin teeth that are used for puncturing fish. So they will be feeding on um, larger and smaller fishes in schools. Next, we have the bull shark, which is a really unique shark that I mentioned that can be found up in rivers that can actually handle fresh water. It's one of the few shark species if, that can actually handle um, total fresh water. Um, these guys, you can tell that they are bull sharks based on their body shape. They're a very broad, wide, um, thicker shark. Most sharks are more, more streamlined and thin. These guys are much, much bigger. They have that triangular shaped dorsal fin and their snout is very broad, blunt, and almost squared off. And then is one of my actual favorites is the common thresher shark. They have a smaller snout, a larger eye, um, and they have that really long, elongate tail. So it's, that upper lobe is super long, and it's about the size of their body length, if not longer. And there's this video from Live Science that I really love. That it shows how they actually use actually use that caudal fin to swim through a school of fish and then use it like a whip to stun their fish and their prey and then they'll go back and feed on it. So you can see them as they kind of swim through that school. Once they get towards the center, they'll use it and whip it at these these fish and then um, ones that are stunned that can go back and, and feed on. So it's a very unique characteristic. One second, it is not moving to the next slide. I will have to, sorry about that, technical difficulty. So next we're moving into some tools and resources. Um, there's some printouts and some digital resources that um, FWC, NOAA, OSEARCH, um, the Florida Museum has to offer that are all free to access, um, starting with some FWC printouts. Um, these are all found on the FWC website. Um, so they have just some quick identifying characteristics of some really common shark species that you can find um, in Florida waters. Um, a unique one I always like to point out with the spinner and black tip shark is when you think of the black tip shark, you think all of their fins will actually be black tipped. However, the spinner shark also has everything uh, black tipped but the spinner shark, actually the anal fin will be black tipped while the black tip will actually have the anal fin that's completely white. So it's a little backwards than what you'd think. So it's a really good key characteristic to look for when you're, when you're shark fishing to see if you have a black tip or a spinner shark is to look at the color of that anal fin. And then looking at the image on the right is the FWC fishing lines book. This is just an image from one of the pages in the fishing lines book. Um, FWC has this great book that talks about different um, fishing poles, knots, um, lures to use, and it has some basic fish and shark ID. It's a really good resource to use when you're starting to fish and when you're going out on the boats or just to the beach. 
Um, here's another one. Um, it's an FWC guide for the highly migratory shark species in Florida. So it's different shark species that move in and out of Florida waters. Um, you can use it by usually start at the very top. So I mentioned two sharks have a dorsal ridge and that's that ridge that line runs along the first dorsal to the second dorsal. So it runs through the middle of it. Um, if it has a ridge, then you would say answer yes. And it tells you to go to the opposite side, which is the, the image on the right side. And if it doesn't, you would say no. And then you would kind of continue down the page until you answered yes and you would move across. It's a really simplified version of a, um, of a, of a shark identification key to kind of get you to the point where you can figure out what type of shark you're looking at. Uh, NOAA actually has some really, really great printouts. Um, I use these all the time. Um, they have um, just basic shark identification guides as well as prohibited shark identification guides. Um, most of the prohibited shark, uh, um, shark species are actually what's called the ridgebacks. So the ridgebacks are the ones that actually have that inner dorsal ridge. So that's a very important characteristic to learn. And then they also have just some practice safe catching and release. And they show you what a D hooker is and different um, hooks to use. And all these resources are available online and are completely free to print out. Um, FWC also has a smart shark fishing course. Um, it shows you how to use proper tackle. Um, when you're fishing for sharks, you need to use a circle hook. Um, a better way to use the circle hooks is actually to flatten or file down the barbs of the hook. It makes it, it much easier to remove the hook, so it's, not, it's less damaging on the shark. Um, using tail ropes can be very, very useful, um, especially as the sharks are moving around. It protects you and it also protects the shark. You want to minimize fight time, so as you're reeling in the shark, you want to make sure that you're not spending too long, because as you're tiring the shark out, it can be damaging to the shark. Um, you also want to keep the gills in water. A lot of people will pull sharks out of the water. You want to do your best to keep the shark within the water because that's how it breathes. So you don't want it out of the water for too long. Also, you want to minimize handling. So when you get the shark in, you want to make sure you're able to remove the hook very quickly and get the shark back in the water. And also do not sit on the shark's back. Uh, a lot of people will try to take pictures on the shark's back, um, posing with it. Um, that can be very damaging for the shark. And it's also usually out of the water. Or if you're trying to do that while it's in the water, it can be very dangerous for you. Um, but if you are wanting to fish for sharks from, from the shore at the beach, um, you have to take a shore-based shark fishing course that can be found on myfwc.com. Um, you will take this course, it'll get you the permit that's required for fishing for sharks by the shore. Um, but in, and it has to be renewed annually. So it's a very important course that teaches you um, uh, shark smart fishing from the boat, from the shore and from a pier. Um, it just gives you a lot of good reminders and then just make sure that you are fishing properly for these species. And that can be found on the FWC website. Also on the FWC website are reminders of the prohibited and then the harvestable sharks. So in Florida, we have um, limits on different sharks that you can keep. Um, either there's no minimum size or they're based on size to their fork length. So when you're looking at the shark on their caudal fin, where the upper lobe and the, and the lower lobe meet and create like that fork in the tail. That's how you get that fork length. So we do have shark species that you can keep in Florida, but there are a decent amount of shark species that are found in Florida that you cannot keep. And it's very important. That's why taking the fishing course can really help you learn which shark species are to be kept and which ones are prohibited to make sure that you are not removing any important shark species that may be vulnerable, endangered, or important to the population. So OSEARCH, uh, this is the group that I get to work with for my master's thesis. They have a really great shark tracker. It's a really great resource. Um, so they have tagged sharks all over the world. Um, they're currently in the Western North Atlantic. So um, they're currently right off the coast of the Carolinas. And you can actually track these sharks just like us in real time. So they use a shark tag called a spot tag that's attached to the dorsal fin of the shark. And when that tag is above the water surface, it'll actually send a ping to the satellite that gives it its location. And when it gets its location, it will be added to the shark tracker, which can be found on osearch.org slash tracker or a, um, on your smartphone, they have a mobile app for Android and iPhone called the uh, shark tracker. And when you get those locations, it'll actually ping and you can see where, where the sharks are, are going. Um, so this is a shark that was my first white shark that I ever got to help tag. Her name is Crystal. Um, we tagged her right off the Outer Banks off of Ocracoke. 
Um, and you can see that since 2022, um, she has traveled all the way up to Newfoundland, Canada, and all the way down to South Carolina. And all the sharks at OSEARCH tags, you can actually track them. You can type in names. They've also tagged other shark species. So you can look at them by species if you want to see the Makos or the tiger sharks. Um, so it's a really good way just to kind of, if you're going to the beach and you want to see who's in the area or to learn a little bit more about where certain shark species go, this is a really great resource. It's something that I use all the time. I love going to the beach or if I'm going to a new place, opening up the app and just seeing who's in the area or who's who's been by the area. Um, I think it's really fun. So there are a lot of books that you could actually um, use that I, I've read all these. I actually have all these. I think these are really good starting point. And these are really good resources to use when you want to learn more about sharks, learn more about their um, anatomy, their biology, um, how to how, why conservation is important, and also just basic um, shark ID. So Why Sharks Matter by David Schiffman is a really great resource. It kind of covers similar topics that I've covered today, a little bit more in depth. Um, sharks of North America by Jose Castro talks about all the different shark species that you can find. Um, in the waters off North America, and it goes very in depth into what their 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 scales look like, the different T shapes, their anatomy, where they're found, their habitat range. It's a very in depth, um, really good resource on each of these species. The Pocket Guide to Sharks of the World is just a really good, quick resource that gives you some quick identifying characteristics. It's really great to um, have with you when you're going fishing if you want to learn some more sharks. And then a really good resource that it's more of a textbook. Um, I've actually used this for one of my classes that I actually still have. It's called um, Shark Biology and Conservation, um, Essential for Educators, Students, Enthusiasts. It's a really great overall book to learn more. And this is, I think these four books are a really good starting point if you really wanna learn more about sharks and learn more about the different species that you can find in the world, as well as especially off our shores in North America. Um, and then the website is uh, Sharks for Kids. I think they have so much information on their website. They are a great resource. I, I still refer to them all the time. I just think they have so much information and they're um, really easy to understand and they, have, they can reach a really broad audience with their, with their information. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go over some safe swimming practices, go very briefly. Um, a lot of times when you're in the water, you know, you are in the water with sharks. Most times you don't realize that you are actually pretty close to sharks. And most times you've been in the water, you've probably been within a, a few feet of a shark and had no idea. They just didn't bother you because they did they didn't had they had nothing to do with you. Um, so some really key things to remember is don't swim near piers and marinas. Usually in piers and marinas, the people are fishing off of these things. So there's a lot of food in the water and they're attracting sharks. So when you're swimming around these areas, you're going to an area that sharks are going to to feed and you're putting yourself in that environment, which can be dangerous for you, especially around marinas. A lot of marinas, they'll have fishing boats come back in. They're filleting the fish on the docks and they're throwing the rest of the carcass in the water, which attracts a lot of sharks because it's a really easy way to get some food. And if, when you jump in, they're thinking it's another uh, fish carcass or you know leftover of fish parts and you're going in and you will accidentally get bit as a mistaken, identif mistaken identity. Um, if you're at the beach and you see fishermen shore fishing, um, you would wanna stay away from them for the same reasons as well. There's, there's bait in the water. Um, you don't wanna get tangled in their lines. And also they're trying to attract fish and shark to the area to catch them. So you being in the water, you're, you're gonna be in the area where there's a lot of, a lot of bait. Um, it's important to also talk to locals. If you're going to a beach you've never been to, um, you really want to talk to the, the lifeguards or people at the beach to kind of see, are, are there areas where sharks are normally seen? Um, are there good or bad areas? Is there an area that is really near a marina that might be more hidden? So you really want to talk with people that are really familiar with the area. Um, really, really important, pay attention to signs and flags. Um, rip currents are a big thing. You'll see flags out that say rip currents, but also there's signs like the picture on the left side of the screen that talk about different sharks you may in encounter. Um, in Florida, the, we actually do have populations of black tip sharks that migrate from the Carolinas and they come in thousands all the way down to Miami. And so you're, at different parts of the year, you're going to see a lot of sharks in the area and that's normal and that's a good thing. 
Um, but you have to pay attention because they might have some signs out saying that the sharks are back in the area. So just to be careful when you're surfing or going uh, past a certain point in the water. And if you are lucky enough to actually see a shark, just stay calm and slowly make your way back to the shore. Um, when you start splashing or start thrashing around, that can actually attract a shark. That actually mimics what um, a dying or distressed fish is, and they're actually gonna think you're a fish and go investigate and see if you are something they can eat. And unfortunately, that can create a bad interaction. So I'm gonna end on respect over fear. Um, the oceans deserve our respect and care, but you have to know something before you can care about it. And this is another great quote by Sylvia Earle. And I'm really hoping that during this um, very general um, shark webinar that you learn something new and maybe it inspired you to learn more and you'll uh, uh, buy some more resources and talk more about sharks and hopefully you'll get more inspired and interested in learning more about these incredible creatures in the ocean and how important they are. And I think it's just important to learn as much as you can to really respect over it. And it really is respect over fear. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I really hope you did learn something. Um, I really enjoyed doing this webinar. It was a great way for me to put together something that kind of was a general view of sharks. Um, if you liked one of these topics, uh, I would I can always do another webinar. So please comment and let me know if there was a certain topic or a certain uh, another topic you would like me to talk about more in depth. I would love to come back and do another webinar. Um, and with that, thank you. I will take any questions. And if you would like to reach out beyond this webinar, I have left my contact information um, on, on there. Um, the QR code you can scan with your phone and it'll take you to my LinkedIn. We can connect on there. Um, and also you can email me uh, with that email address. Thank you. Wow, Kenzie, that was amazing information. Um, viewers, if you have any questions, it's the time right now to put it in the chat. I know sometimes it's a little bit delayed, so I'm um, just going to have a few comments and then we'll see what pops up in there. So, uh, yeah, Kenzie, you blew my mind. I had no idea that uh, it took sharks like about 20 years to mature, right? Um, growing up, I've always liked sharks. I remember uh, even in elementary school watching Shark Week, but I maybe I missed that. I didn't, you know, they never really talk about how long it takes for a shark to mature. So. Um, it brings a lot of, to me, a different respect level for sharks and keeping around being that they take that long to mature and things like that. So um, uh, you were talking about, um, you know, the tagging and the O-search you did. Like, so in that research, I, I think the shark that they first tagged here off of Jacksonville was Mary, what was her name? Mary Lynn? Mary Lee. Right? Yeah, Mary Lee. Okay. Yeah. Mary Lee. So with Mary Lee, um, that's been a while, right? So when they when you track again do they do you in your expeditions do you um, track the shark try to bring the shark back in and do measurements again and that's how it's um being able to find the growth in those years and how how you know how much it grows so we according to o search um they have actually never uh caught a a tag shark again uh we actually had one of our tag sharks swim close to the boat while we were out on the latest expedition. Um, and Bonnie, she got really, probably still several miles from the boat, but still swam uh, right where we were. Um, so we were hoping that we would see her, but unfortunately we didn't. Um, but we use the, we can figure out the size based on looking at different animals and kind of how old they are. Um, and we can do an estimation on their growth. So we can assume that in the past two years, um, I'm not sure of exactly how much she would have grown, but we can have a rough estimation on how long it's been since we've tagged her and how long, um, excuse me, um, how big she could be now. Um, but that's just based on different uh, uh, diet studies and as well as um, like uh, anatomy studies. I, I'm not very well versed in that. That's not really mm -hmm. my expertise. Mm -hmm. um, but I can find the information out for you. So if you would like to know more about how they estimate the size, especially with the tag sharks, I can definitely reach out to some people at O-Search and get that information for you. That's it. very cool. That was just something that kind of came to my mind. It was just mind blowing for me that it took that long for a shark. You would think uh, as predatorial as it is, 
you would think that um, it would grow a lot faster. So that's that's really cool information too. And then the fact that um, how they can adapt to temperatures well too was a, a surprise for me for the white shark when they tagged you know tagged the first shark here in Jacksonville. Um, that was amazing too as well. You also touched about you know the ecosystem how important it was. I didn't think that a a shark in the water can also be a, a huge difference it's on land um so that's uh, again that's information that i you know we didn't know i just as an angler and a captain myself i don't um you know we catch sharks and it's usually catch release um you know for us i don't know many people that harvest sharks but i remember growing up when i was young visiting panama city beach that uh, it was one place that had a buffet and you can usually catch um have sharks on that buffet so Again, being how and uh, being seeing how important a shark is to the ecosystem and even climate climate change that you know that's mind blowing too. You know, it's kind of like yeah, you know, should we harvest those those fish at all? And I know you know you working for FWC and then NOAA and um, other agencies look at you know if you have too many sharks, if you don't have enough sharks, and be able to you know come up with those laws and those regulations. So um, to me, this is why education is so important where, um, you know, you know, coming to webinars like this, um, this is why we do them. This is why we have free webinars to educate people is usually um, they don't know, you know, just when I see people swimming by peers, by people fishing, like you mentioned, or by marinas, I'm like, that's crazy. You know, I can't, I wouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I would never do that. But again, I've had, I have that knowledge of knowing that through fishing, you know, as you become a better angler you know how they you know how fish live you know where they're um you know where the areas are where they, they you know what we say pounce on other fish or they you know they hide behind so we know to stay out of those zones like i don't when the sun goes down you're not going to catch me in the ocean just because i yeah. know what type of animals come out at that time so um yeah that's really cool really good stuff i'm i'm looking now i really don't see any questions that um that have come in so far and and that's fine you know we can always continue to um send those to you i know they have their contact information and we don't want to keep you long at all as well um let me make sure did i have any other questions that i may have missed that i wrote down nope um uh, i see that as well go ahead i say while you're looking through that i do want to touch that you know you mentioned something about you know fishing for sharks. Um, there's actually a really big shark fishery in Florida. Mm. And um, the main thing when it comes to shark fisheries is just sustainability. So mm -hmm. knowing that the, the population is healthy enough that you can remove individuals from that population without damaging that population. Um, so it's just, it's okay to, to, you know, to fish for sharks, but it, the, the key thing is just sustainability. So making sure you're following the rules and regulations and making sure that when new limits come out that you're really following those limits. And that's what's really important to making sure that we're keeping populations healthy is following the, the rules and regulations set by these different agencies that have spent years monitoring these populations. So that's, that's a really key point. Okay. Yeah, that is very true. And I do have some comments on Facebook. Um, one of the comments, that's, let's go back to the, the, how long it takes, you know, for the maturity, right? 20 years. The question was, how are, how are immature sharks protected while growing? So that depends on the shark species. So um, mangroves are actually a really uh, good way for small young of year. So newborn sharks within the year and juvenile sharks to kind of hide within these areas and stay away from larger sharks because actually larger sharks of the same species and, and different species will actually feed on smaller sharks that's just something that happens so a lot of the the smaller sharks um, will stay within the mangroves or stay in more shallower protected areas that these larger sharks can't reach um, white sharks will actually especially in our population on the western north atlantic actually have nursery habitats. There's one up in the New York area and a secondary one in, in the Carolinas region. Um, but they're actually gonna stay closer to shore. They're not gonna uh, venture too far out into the shelf edge and swim in these deeper waters where they're gonna be encountering these larger sharks. They kind of have these different areas that they swim in to kind of mm -hmm. just stay away from the larger sharks. So it really depends on the different shark species on how, they, how the younger ones will protect themselves against the bigger ones. 
Okay. Thank you. Do we have another one that says, do sharks lose their skin? And it says parentheses teeth, like they lose their teeth in their mouth. Um, no. So the, they don't. So when you're looking at a shark jaw, um, their teeth, they have, um, the functional teeth, which is the, the first row that they're using. And they have the reserved ones on, on the back that will actually pop up. But with the shark skin there, um, they can, um, rebuild the skin, but they are not ha they're not shedding as, as often as like the shark's teeth. Um, I can, that's a, that's actually a really great question and I don't want to give you wrong information. So if, if you can take down that question or from uh, the information from that person, or if that person wants to email me, I can look up a paper, um, that's on the shark skin and get you exact, uh, information on okay. how, how shark skin, um, uh, heals and how, how it is, how it functions. I just don't want to give you wrong information on that. Great. Great. And we can make sure to send that to you too, as well. Another yes. question is, are the egg casings called mermaid purses and how long from when they lay an egg to when it is ready to hatch? So basically, you know, how long from that time when they're laid, are they ready to hatch those eggs or those mermaid purses as they call? So it can vary. So yeah, they are called mermaid purses. Usually the ones that you are normally seeing as mermaid purses are actually skate uh, egg casing. So I mentioned um, sharks are cartilaginous fishes, or I, there was an extra, another term that was said uh, chondrichthians, which means again, cartilaginous fishes that includes sharks, skates, and rays. Um, so they're all within that same group. Um, so skates are a cartilaginous fish that's related to sharks. Um, and that's when you, when you see a mermaid purse or you hear someone call a mermaid purse on the beach, that's usually what you're seeing. Um, but it, it varies depending on the species. Um, just like the, 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 the gestation periods that the, how, how long they're within the mother's womb varies between mm -hmm. shark species. It also varies how long they're in the, in the egg and it could be several months that they are actually within the egg forming and developing. Um, and after a period of time, it's really interesting that the egg casing will be completely enclosed for a period of time. And then as it gets um, closer to emerging from that egg casing, there's these slits in it that will actually open up and create a transfer of seawater into the egg casing. So then it will get all the bacteria and it'll get all the, the oxygen from the ocean itself wow. kind of moving through before it comes out of the egg casing. So you're starting to see like a progression of it being completely enclosed to slightly opening up to completely opening up and that shark actually hatching from that egg. Wow, that's amazing. I, <laughs> nature <laughs> blows my mind all the time of the yeah. things that it can do, right? I was like, if I yeah. can do like half of what nature does, I'll be like a lot healthier person, <laughs> probably happier too. <laughs> that's awesome. We have another one that says, what's your favorite shark and why, Kinsey? My favorite shark is actually the great hammerhead. Um, the one I showed you in the video. I think they're just so unique. Um, Really, it's kind of hard to pick between all the hammerheads, um, but I'll tell you two of my favorites that kind of hold the number one spot for me, but it's a great hammerhead. Um, they're just so unique. Um, I think they're absolutely beautiful. And when you see them in the water, they're they're just absolutely stunning. And I've been lucky enough to see a couple of them in the water. Um, they're just that large dorsal fin is so unique to them that when you see it, you know immediately you're looking at a great hammerhead. Um, the other species that kind of holds the top uh, number one spot for me is the winged head hammerhead. Is uh, the cephalofoil, so that hammer-shaped head um, on the winged head is very long. It's actually the same length as the body. So if you take the length of the head, it, it's about the same length of the body. So it looks kind of weird because it has this really large, skinny, long head cephalofoil and this little mm -hmm. tiny body. Um, they're just a really unique and just, I think it's just their anatomy and the way they look is just so different from other shark species that it, they just become one of my favorites. Nice. Nice. And, um, the great hammerhead, I know you research sharks a lot and you've, you've probably heard about this. There's a, um, I know you've been to the keys of course, right? You've been to down past marathon, yes. right? And then you've been to uh, Bay of Hunter state park. So you know about the flag of railroad. So when tarpon run happens, I've seen many times that there's a, I'm pretty sure from what you're, you're saying is a great hammerhead that just runs through the tarpon and you can see it on any fishing videos and you can actually see it on YouTube videos where 
you know, that, that big, great white is just sitting there chilling, just waiting for that tarpon to get tired. And right before it starts to get into the boat, it just comes and just rips it off and just thrashing all over the water. So they're amazing how yeah. big they are. I think I saw a video where a guy was on a 17 foot, uh, you know, um, a skiff, right? And a hammerhead mm -hmm. just came below. I'm like, you know, went right under the boat and it made that 17 foot skiff look like it was the smallest boat in the world. I was like, oh my goodness. So <laughs> it, it's amazing how big sharks are. I know we were out, I was out fishing with a buddy and uh, we hooked up, maybe it was in 150 feet of water. We were probably about 40 to 50 miles off of St. Augustine and hooked into a, 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 a huge bull shark. It was a 14, I was about a 14 foot bull shark. And it was amazing. I, I could not believe how big that shark was and powerful. So a lot of respect mm -hmm. there, but yes, beautiful. I saw, I think it was a little like yellow, um, like a lot of neon yellow in that bull shark eye, but didn't know that. So it was a very beautiful animal. Um, we have awesome. one more and, and we're going to end it on this. What is the biggest shark species? Uh, the biggest shark species is actually the whale shark. Um, oh. So they are, like I mentioned, the basking shark, which is also a very large shark species. Um, the whale shark is a filter feeder. So similar, it will open its mouth and swim through um, the water and collect all the plankton and filter it. So the the largest shark is one that you don't have to worry about they uh, at all. They are very, very harmless. They said they're, they're um, they, they filter feed and they eat on plankton. But uh, it's always funny when I have people that come to tell me they have uh, swam with them, which is an amazing thing. I've actually never done it and it's on my yeah. list, but I've heard amazing things about it. They are much faster than you think. You, you see these videos of them just slowly swimming right. along, but they're right. so big and that caudal fin is so powerful <laughs> that they don't have to move it too much to actually be flying through the water. So most times people say that they are, they feel like they're running a marathon in the water, swimming to keep up with it. Um, but they are, I think, an, an amazing creature, but yes, they are the actual largest shark in the ocean. That's super cool. That's super cool. So, hey, um, Kenzie, thank you so much again for your your time and all the information, man. I, I had a blast. I learned a lot today. Um, you know, if you want to go, like, like Kenzie said, if you want to go more in depth with sharks, which you see she can, she's a wealth full of, uh, uh, you know, a wealth full of knowledge. Um, yeah, let's let's do it again. You know, send us some messages, what you want to learn about, and we'll get Kenzie back on here. We have to have her back on here. This is amazing. Um, Kenzie has more resources that we'll be emailing to you if you signed up and registered on our website. If you did not, if you just um, jumped on a social media or um, or YouTube, that's fine. Uh, PM us, give us your um, email, and we'll and let us know you want that resource, and we'll send it to you as well. Um, we also are launching a new website soon for Soul March Fishing and Conservation Foundation. So we'll be having new um, a new clothing line is coming out. Um, you'll have free courses on there you can take, as well as it'll have our event calendar. We also have a social forum that's going to be on there, as well as a lot more. So you don't want to miss out. You want to make sure um, you you follow us on that too as well. Make sure to check out our events that's coming up for 2024. We'll be starting to post those, uh, register and come with us and have fun. Usually all the time, every time you come to our event, we're always giving some away. So you can get decals, you can get um, uh, straws, you can get all type of cool things. And those straws are metal straws, by the way, they're not plastic straws. We're very huge on that. We wanna also uh, always thank Keep St. John's County Beautiful. Um, they help with the cleanups and uh, as an initiative of Soul March Fishing and Conservation Foundation. And we do good things keeping the uh, coastal waters clean by uh, picking up trash and having events like that too as well. And a big thanks to Soul March, I'm sorry, a big thanks to RMAC Media Group for putting together all the cool videos and the graphics for this webinar. And, you know, we're just super excited of what they have done for us and the production they put out there. And we just have some more great things to do with them coming in two, um, 2024. Wow, it's crazy that it's already here. But I want to say happy holidays to everyone. Uh, once again, thanks to Kinsey and everyone be safe and we'll see you pretty soon again. Make sure to check out for your email for our next webinar. So bye-bye guys. Happy holidays. Thank you, Kinsey.